Well, thank you all for coming for the last of our spring lecture series here at the Loudoun Museum. Uh, we do have some more things coming up for this summer. Uh, we'll start promoting very soon. Uh, but we're excited that for the month of July, we're going to have a traveling exhibit downstairs from the Hampton History Center. Um, that is called 1619 First Arrival of Africans. Uh, so we're excited to bring that to the museum. Uh, we'll have it open throughout the entire month. Uh, and our next lecture is on July 17th. Uh, where Rick Murphy, the acclaimed author, is going to be coming to speak on the topic of 1619 uh, for uh, forced arrival of slaves to Virginia. Uh, so we'll be promoting that uh, throughout the month. So we hope you can join us to see that exhibit and come to that next talk. I'm excited to have Dr. Brumall here today, though. Uh, he's going to be talking about some of the research from his new book, Private Confederacy, The Emotional Worlds of Southern Men as Citizens and Soldiers. And Dr. Brumall received his uh, doctorate from the University of Florida, and he's currently an assistant professor at Shepherd University, uh, where he's also the director of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. Can't add any more to that title. I know. <laughs> I'm sure I have a lot of time. <laughs> and he's also a strong advocate for public history. Uh, he had, we have a master's in museum studies. He works with other local museums and organizations and battlefields. Uh, so you'll probably see his name around working with some of the other public institutions, uh, promoting the importance of local history and preserving that history. Uh, so please welcome me in joining Dr. Brumall for his talk. Hey, hi everyone. Um, thank you to Joe. I met Joe many, many years ago at the Southern Historical Association in New Orleans, I believe. And um, I was extremely pleased when he uh, got the directorship here at the Lotte Museum. Uh, my wife and I, who's in the audience, uh, visit Leesburg with some frequency. and. Um, are very happy to see everything that's, that's happening in this space, and um, I think there's a very bright future here. Um, and thank you to you all for coming out on this lovely evening. Um, my assistant and I have been out in Gaysburg all day uh, in the field with a group of public historians from the National Park Service, so I kind of frantically threw on uh, some dress clothes. Um, I'm still a little field uh, weary, so I apologize. We'll see how this talk goes. But that's when I started to kind of change the subject matter and surprise Joe when I sent the PowerPoint yesterday. Um, we're in the month of June. Um, the Gatesburg campaign is upon us. Um, a lot of the themes of the book can be distilled uh, through this, this one chapter um, about the battle. And I thought it was appropriate given that it's been the day in Gatesburg and that it's um, published in a week in Gatesburg for the uh, Civil War Institute and a uh, week and a half that I would kind of try some things out with you all this evening. Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and start. And I'll make this pretty conversational, I'll try to draw, uh, draw out some, some larger themes. Um, but again, this is a relatively entirely new talk for me, so I'm also going to have to rely a little bit more on the paper than I like to otherwise do. But I'm going to start here on July the 3rd, 1863, in some of the most famous fields in the Western Hemisphere. Um, how many of you have actually been to the Gaither Battlefield? Okay, so the vast majority of you. Um, the Union lines, as you probably know, are, are, are trusted on uh, Cemetery Ridge. The Confederate lines are departing from Seminary Ridge. And one of the participants in that fight is a relatively young officer in his late 20s, John Dooley. He's a captain in the 1st uh, Virginia. He will go on to study at Georgetown, um, I think it was then college, near university. And he writes a very vivid account of the battle that he publishes shortly after the war, 1865, 1866. And this account, in some ways, is very traditional. It's used in many of the larger histories of the Battle of Gettysburg. But what struck me about this particular description are some of the scenes that he sought to portray. And so I'm going to read a couple of quotes from you. The men at this point, the Confederates that is, um, are on the reverse slope of Seminary Ridge. They're just <coughs> There's artillery fire. Most of the, the, the missiles are going above them. And as they wait and wait and wait, anticipation starts to give way to boredom. So frivolous can men be, observed Dooley, even in the hour of death, that men begin lobbying green apples at each other. They're seeking moments of amusement, of fun. But then, quite suddenly, he writes, earth and sky seem to open and darken the air with smoke and death-dealing missiles. 
This amusement quickly turns to anxiety as the men continue to wait as the federal artillery fire continues to increase um, in urgency and indeed as it starts now dropping among the men. One officer is straining to hear the words of his sergeant, turns away to talk to the man on his left, turns back around to see the sergeant's face entirely displaced by a shell, the man killed instantaneously. And then Dooley says the men are up. Some begin to faint from the heat. Some begin to faint from the dread. Some begin to pray, making a profane space sacred, at least temporarily. Oh, wrote Dooley, if there is anything capable of crushing and wringing the soldier's heart, it was this day's tragic act and all in vain. So as you all know, of course, this culminating assault ends in dramatic failure. And again, Dooley's account is one that historians have used writ large, repeatedly, in their books about this battle. But what I was so drawn to more was his focus on emotions, emotional expression. How did men understand and represent the experience of battle? How did they stifle emotions of fear? How did they bubble over in moments of amusement? How did they try to understand a seemingly incomprehensible experience? And so again, Dooley's description can recount for us, of course, July the 3rd, but what it also tells us is that there are a host of competing emotions that render the forests and fields of South Central Pennsylvania fractured landscapes. In the hours before Pickett's charge, the killing field is turned briefly into a playground. A deadly projectile silences an intimate conversation between an officer and a sergeant. Praying soldiers, as I just said, make the profane sacred. And then there's John Woolley, again, who becomes a graduate of Georgetown College and later a member of the Jesuit order, an educated man trying to make sense of it all, trying to, to, to render the spectacle of battle into some sort of decipherable form. And so today then, I'm going to, central, I'm going to focus in on the central question, a question that has really kind of gripped me for the better half of almost at this point, two decades time. And this question for me is going to be filtered through the lens of the experiences of white Southerners because the, that's the study sample I chose. But in many ways, the observations I'll have today, I think, could apply writ large to Union soldiers and the experience of war, at least in the 19th century. I'm very careful not to make broader generalizations about the experience of war more broadly than that. But, and what I'm, but for the 19th century, I think I have some claims that can, can kind of be rather expansive in the interpretation. And what I'm so curious about is how, again, in my case, Confederate soldiers respond to the experience of war and the deaths of their comrades. And what I'm going to argue is that there is very little in antebellum culture that had prepared men for the experiences that they would confront on these battlefields. Very little. And so if you think about the antebellum Southern man, how he crafts his masculinity, how he understands his world. It's a world defined by independence. It's a world defined by a great deal of certitude. It's a world in which he maintains a public mask because of the strict racial and social hierarchies that govern that society. It's a man, again, that's defined by this self-direction. Yet, when he enters into the military service, he is subordinate. He is part of a military regime. He is told when to get up in the morning, at what time he's going to off, uh, offer his voice for roll call, when he must present, when he drills, when he goes on guard duty, when he eats. There is a tremendous loss of independence across this experience. And so that starts to shake, shake some of the foundational elements of antebellum Southern man. They don't call everything into question yet, but it starts to shake and displace some of those foundations. But then what happens when they greet battle 
And so what I'm gonna try to do today is walk us through a couple of these different stages. I'm gonna talk about the first experience that one soldier has on a battlefield and how his descriptions begin to change over time. I'm going to talk about how two men try to make sense of the gangs for battlefield in particular. And how on the one hand they're going to kind of order it in a way that aligns with Victorian cosmology, the Victorian worldview, and on the other hand, how that core guiding assumption, that worldview, becomes shaken and displaced, and how many of these men begin to reel, begin to have trouble making sense of all of this carnage, of all of this death. And then I'm going to try to bring it all together by talking about the personal impact of the loss of a messmate, the loss of a brother, the loss of a father, the loss of kin. And what we can see from all of this is that, in fact, soldiers feel many conflicting emotions at once. Apathy, outrage, patriotism, ambivalence. Comrades and those in power, while they themselves struggle to survive a remorseless war of death and destruction. So that's our arc for the course of today. Now I'm very interested in notions of masculinity, and so how we behave, right? Um, our gendered lives is very much a construct, and, and these constructions change over time. The ideal man of the 1950s was different than the ideal woman of the 1860s, and the ideal man of the 1850s in the North was slightly different than the ideal man of the 1850s in the South. And so I'm interested in how these men kind of adapt to this military life and how they, they kind of have different types of masculinity that they use. Martial men, for instance, martial men um, portray themselves as ready for a fight. They're extremely excited by the anticipation of battle. Marching breaks up the monotony in camp. Military action fosters some sort of meaningful sense of purpose. The more circumspect soldiers probably had anxiety, expressed concern about the distance from home. And again, these very reactions show us there's kind of no single common soldier, no single representative example of how men would uh, respond to the experience of war. And I think we can get at some of these more abstract ideas by paying close attention to the letters and diaries of these men. One scholar has recently estimated that there were half a billion, half a billion letters written north and south between 1861 and 1865. That's an absolute outpouring. One of the men that I'll look at today, from Lynchburg, Virginia, but far uh, down the valley from here, not too far, he was writing throughout the antebellum era. You would expect him to write letters to his family during the war. That was what he knew. But the other man I'm going to talk about ever so briefly, who my colleague Pete Carmichael introduced to you all a couple of months ago at this point, um, is John Fudge, an illiterate farmer, someone who had someone write for him, who never would have rendered on paper anything in the antebellum era, but is compelled in this instance to write because he needs to convey the enormity of the experience, in this case, of his brother's death in battle. How remarkable then for me as a scholar to have the voice of a non-literate, non-slaveholding, yeoman farmer from the area of Wilmington, North Carolina, and also the voice of an articulate lawyer in the post-war period from Lynchburg who um, uh, just has some stunning depictions, some, some eerie like depictions of this battle. And so we have this just this multitude of source materials that allow us to begin to understand the range of emotions engendered by the conflict. And again, how in some cases, this conflict is undermining white Southerners' self assurance and in some cases, leaving men grasping for comprehension. The war doesn't create droves of atheists, but the war does call into question that providential sense of order. It does call into question a universe that had seemed so orderly in 1860 
and seems to be permanent the chaos in 1861, 1862. So again, how do men respond to all these experiences? That's where we're going to be going um, over the course of this evening. And I'll promise to watch all the time. So, one individual that I start with is Leonidas Torrance. He's a young, young man, I think around the age of 20, 21, in the period of 1862, 1863. He's a member of the 23rd North Carolina. Torrance, like many green recruits in 1861, is extremely excited about the war. He writes to his family that he eagerly wished, quote, to get into a battle. He and his comrades refused to go home satisfied without a fight. So in 1861, he represents the rage military. He represents the feelings of many men, north and south, who have never experienced battle before, have never experienced war before. They're extremely excited by the prospect. And his letters at home bolster that view, bolster that opinion. Now, June 1862, right around this time, over 155 years ago, he's on the peninsula of Virginia. The peninsula, of course, is one of the pivotal campaigns of the early part of the war in which George B. McClellan marches up from Yorktown, eventually gets within the gates of Richmond, and these Confederate soldiers have seen some heavy fight. Some heavy fight. Torrance writes to his family, quote, The balls were flying around us as thick as hail. All the time, it did not look like there was any chance a man could go through them without being hit. A man who had had a great deal of certitude, even excitement about the war, he's now feeling insecure. He's feeling a bit powerless on this big battlefield. He's reeling from the effects, and what's he do? He turns immediately to paper, because he begins to realize that this is his thread home. This is the connective tissue that he can maintain with the home folks. This could be, in many instances, the last letter that he writes to those people at home. And what I found in my scholarship is that soldiers become profoundly revealing in these letters because life becomes incredibly fleeting. How hard must that be for a 20 or 21 year old man, the men who occupied these ranks by the hundreds of thousands north and south? His correspondence begins to change. The bravado begins to drop away. Uncertainty begins to grip him, but nothing had prepared him for what he witnesses in the first days of May, 1863. In the first days of May, 1863, Robert E. Lee comes to the battle with Joseph Hooker in an area known as Chancellorsville, or the wilderness writ large. It's a horrific battle. It sets up the beginnings of the Gettysburg campaign. It is an overwhelming Confederate victory. But, for the rank and file, it seems like this, they get seared into their minds. So once again, we have a letter from Torrance, I've quoted it at length on the, uh, the board here, and I think this is one of the more difficult letters that um, I found in the archives. He's writing to his mother. He's writing to his mother, and he says, Mother, I thought I had saw as distressing sights on the battlefield as ever I could see to look at, at the men killed and wounded. He's already seen a lot, he says, but where we fought last Sunday, the burns set the woods afire, and to look at killed and wounded men burning was the worst looking sight I ever saw or heard of. He's seen men consumed by fire, men who in some cases are already in terrible anguish because of the wounds sustained on that battlefield. Again, he's not unfamiliar with battlefields. He has seen them during the Peninsula Campaign. And he goes on, I can't give you any idea of what a sight it was to walk over the battlefield. I can't describe this. And see the men lying with their clothes burned off, their hair burned close to their head, their arms and legs drawn up with fire. I never saw such a distressing sight before. And here's the key. And hope I never see such another. The bravado of 1861 is gone. These are men who are, in some instances now, dreading the next battle because of the scenes that are going to unfold. And Torrance will see another battle. And Torrance will be, in fact, casually on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. And I'm going to go back to him in a bit here because we don't have much more correspondence from him. 
but we do have a correspondence from some of his comrades. So similar soldiers are perplexed by this, this experience of war. They want to write home about it. They feel like the kin at home need to know about it. But as they say in their letters, they have immense difficulty communicating it. How can they represent it? How, how can they portray their experiences? And what I find again is they go back to emotional expression time and time again. Men who in the Antebellum era would have been profoundly unwilling to disclose these types of feelings are doing so in intimate terms in these letters home to their family, trying to make sense of this experience through the only way they know how, how they felt, how they felt about the experience of war. And this, I would argue, is starting to shift, change, and transform these men, transform their notions of masculinity, transform their relationships to family, and most importantly for the talk today at least, transform their relationships with other men, their comrades in arms, the esprit de corps that they built, the morale that they maintained. Again, extraordinarily unusual in the antebellum era. Men were very disinclined to form deep emotional connections with other men. It wasn't part of the landscape. Few instances, college fraternities, evangelical religious societies, temporary moments in time, but now these men are thrust into a, a homosexual world, right? They're around men all the time. They're comrades in arms on whom they depend for their very lives. And so they connect in these very profound ways, and I, I emphasize that point here because I want to go back to Torrance in a bit, so just kind of keep this in your mind as we continue to go through um, this material. Here, here are the two men I referenced earlier. And so again, we have John Daniel photographed. It makes sense. He has the socioeconomic means to do so. We have no photograph of John Fletch. can afford it. In the census data, Fletch is listed in his father's household. He himself is not even a, you know, a freeholder, not even an independent Republican citizen in the terminology of the period, and certainly not someone who's going to have a photograph simply doesn't have the economic means. But again, we do have this correspondence. So we'll get to these guys here in a second. Now, for me, the reason why these two accounts matter is because of the ways that they write about this battle, the Battle of Gettysburg, in such detail. The ways they try to give it meaning and shape and coherence. And again, the types of emotions that they reveal throughout their accounts. And John Daniel, in this case, writes what he calls an account of the battle. So it's the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond, going through collections, going through collections, going through collections, a lot of letters, a lot of letters. And then I come across the Daniel collection. And in that collection is this handwritten 50 or 60 page account, <clears throat> just as a calculator. I couldn't date it, it's just, I, I couldn't quite date it. I thought it was probably wartime, couldn't quite tell. It wasn't written right after the battle, probably 64, 65. Well, it ends up, Daniel was preparing a manuscript that gets published in the Battles and Leaders series. I think probably some of you have been familiar with that. So he publishes this account in 1875, but by 1875, he drains out a lot of things I'm gonna highlight here. So in 1875, he publishes a very traditional account of the Battle of Gettysburg through his eyes. The account that I'm going to give you, the handwritten account that was for his purposes only, talks a lot about ambiguity, talks a lot about the horrors of the battlefield, and talks a lot about uncertainty. The 1875 account, all that's washed away. John Futch is about as raw and real as it gets because Futch himself is going to be killed for deserting in early September 1865. Three. We're not going to spend too much time on the question because I think Pete probably gave him just, did him justice. But I, I want to use his account because it's, it's, it's one of the most unfiltered portrayals of death that I've encountered probably in any letter collection during the Civil War era. So those are our, our, our tasks uh, this evening. Now on the one hand, and you've already seen it in the Torrance letter, Soldiers repeatedly say that they're unable to describe the battle. They write this in letter after letter after letter. What you often see is, you 
probably read about in the newspapers, I have nothing to add. Well, on the one hand, yeah, I think that's a logical reaction. On the other hand, I think they're just trying to figure out what they can and cannot say to their loved ones. I mean, Torrance's letter, in some ways, is a shocking disclosure to his mother. A shocking disclosure to his mother. A lot of the correspondence I've seen during this era tends to be a lot more guarded, tends to be more concealing. But Torrance is, I think, just so distraught by his experiences that he's just trying to find some means of letting it out. The soldiers often say that they're un unable to um, portray these events. Language often fails them. Language often fails them. So what do they use? Then? What markers do they use to make sense of these experiences? And that's what we're going to try, try to try to understand um, through some of these letters. And the first, uh, the first material comes from John Daniel. So by the Battle of Gettysburg, Daniel is serving as a major with Major General Jubal Early's um, uh, uh, division. And, sorry, yes, division, yeah. Um, and he's coming down from north of Gettysburg on July the 1st. They arrive on the battlefield relatively late and don't take part in the fight. That is important because what Daniel sees is not clashing armies. He instead confronts the aftermath, the aftermath of battle. And one of the things that I would urge you all to do if you visit some more battlefields is as you're walking across them and thinking about the truth that was before you, pause for a minute and turn around and think about what was behind you. There was, on the one hand, if you go far enough back, in case of Gettysburg, thousands of slaves that came up with their own army, enslaved laborers. There were hundreds of thousands, hundreds of wagons, hundreds of thousands of mules and horses. You come closer, depending on where you're on the battlefield, you will have seen scenes like this. The photograph, of course, taken on the Gettysburg battlefield days after the battle. And that's the scene that Daniel encounters. And what's interesting about this account is he juxtaposes two different types of emotional landscapes. On the one hand, Daniel is moving into an area where the Confederates have been victorious. On day one, Lee's army meets resounding success. He pushes back the 1st and 11th Corps through the town onto the heights beyond the town in the southwest section. He has achieved many of his goals. The men are jubilant. They're saying more fires in the street. They're cooking coffee. They're eating food. They're plundering scores. He writes, while on the front, games were kept in so illustrated for the joys and animation of the war, but the rear has been equally exemplary of its woes. So he juxtaposes these two ideas and uses that as some way to begin to kind of sculpt and craft this account of the battlefield. And it's incredibly, incredibly descript uh, descriptive. And he says, the front lines were overwhelmed by beaming faces, elastic steps, gay voices, stirring music, and waving banners. But to the ghastly fields behind, he observed, quote, the grotesque, all white eye turned back within its socket. And then he says, let us look over the field, acting as guide and observer. He says, quote, Union soldiers were scattered in every direction, some on their faces, some on their backs, some with faces arrested in agony, some with a smile, still others, as though they were in gentle sleep. The wounded, writhing in pain, and imploring aid. And in some ways, when we see these photographs, all we hear, of course, is silence. And the battlefield was anything but silence. To his front, there were still the cannons going off, still the small arms fire. But then the area around him was filled with wounded for riding in extreme agony. By nightfall, hogs would be descending upon the field, consuming those men who are dead, not to be too grotesque. I mean, these are the, battle, these are the scenes, the battlefields, that these men are confronting. 
And what's so striking about Daniel's account is he tries to make sense of all of this in a way that's very human to Victorian cosmology. And we see this in particular through his emphasis, his choice to focus in on those men that had died what they would have called a good death. So if you haven't had the opportunity, I would urge you to read Drew Faust's book, This Republic of Suffering. It is one of probably the best books on the Civil War era written, and Faust goes to great lengths talking about this good death. And for 19th century Americans, the good death, does anyone know Faust? Do you want to you give us a quick sketch of the good death? Did you remember? Yeah, they sort of made it, I don't know if you say glorious, but rewarding and not. In other words, it was a higher purpose for the death. It wasn't a waste of a life. It was. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, it, 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 it was for a higher purpose, and that's central to the good death. That is certainly central. It's a death in which you don't die with pain. It's a death in which you resign yourself to God's will. It's a death in which you have told your loved ones that you resign yourself to your fate. And there's a certain serenity that comes over the body, supposedly, as you're surrounded by family, and then you gently pass away. This was critically important for 19th century Americans, and they tried to kind of piece the good death together. In the midst of all this chaos, what does Daniel do? He focuses in on an artillery group. His face expressed no pain, but was serene and beautiful. No blood stained his clothes. The bullet has done, had done its work, but had left but little trace. I could but sigh as I passed by, but it was no time for lamentation, particularly for a foe, and I went on to mingle with the joyful and forget the dead. But I found that so striking in this extended account. Daniel focuses, a, focuses, focuses it in on a figure like this. This is a, probably one of the most iconic photographs of the American Civil War. I assume most of you have seen this. It's titled Rebel, Sharp, Rebel Sharpshooter. It was taken at Gettysburg. What we now likely you know through the research of William Frazzanito is that this figure has actually been moved. He was in what was called the Valley of Death, um, Bloody uh, Run, the area between Little Round Top and Devil's Den. His body has moved 75 yards, placed in the midst of Devil's Den, behind what was a period kind of um, defensive wall for a sharpshooter. And then the body is carefully arranged in a way that he died seemingly a non-violent death. He, he, in one, there's two versions of this photograph. In one version, there's a blanket underneath the body, a knapsack below his head, he looks like he's sleeping. That's very deliberate on the part of the photographer because I think there is this desire to portray that and represent that good death. And so I found it kind of compelling that Daniel focuses in on a scene like this, not the scene, of course, but a scene like this of a Union artillery with his foe. And what's he focusing on? The fact that he was able to achieve the good death, a serene and beautiful expression. He's talking about a dead body here, a serene and beautiful expression. Now, as we go on, and I'll conclude this section on, on Daniel here in a sec, um, he starts to feel a degree of, I think, ambiguity. He's extremely excited, on the one hand, by the victories of the day, but on the other hand, he's profoundly disturbed by the scenes of death around him. He's trying to juggle these competing emotions that he has within him, and again, What's so interesting to me is this is his raw description. In 1875, that's all gone. There's no more ambiguity. There's no more uncertainty. He writes a very state account. But when he's freshly remembering these scenes, it's a lot less definitive in his mind. Now, the other element of the good death is going to be applicable to this letter here. And so I promised you just a brief, brief John Futch story because, again, Pete has, has done his duty here. Um, John and, and Charlie Futch are forced, basically, to fight the battle that Lee creates after July the 1st. Because Lee pushes those, well, because Lee's army pushes those Federals 
through the town and onto the heights, the Federal Army in turn secures Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and then eventually will around the best topographical positions on the battlefield. The men who are going to fight on the far Union right flank, so if you know that classic fish look, it's like the bar of the book. Culp's Hill is Allegheny Johnson's division, Stewart's brigade, within that brigade is the 3rd North Carolina. Within the 3rd North Carolina, two brothers, John and Charlie Fouch. Again, Charlie's probably literate, John illiterate, or, or pretty positive. Every letter in the collection is written by someone else's hand, most likely. And what's curious then is how does John balance his brother's death? Because his brother will be killed on July the 2nd at the foot of Culp's Hill. He'll be hit in the head with a mini ball. He'll be immediately rendered unable to speak. He'll languish. He'll be in anguish for several days, and he dies. Some, uh, some sorry, many hours he dies on the third. John very quickly begins writing a series of letters home about this death, and in every instance, the death is portrayed slightly differently. And again, um, I hate to ruin my book, but I have a lot more about this in my book. But um, just for our purposes here today, and this gentleman brought to our attention. He is dead, but I believe he is happy, and no doubt far better off than any of us. He is removed from the world of suffering. This is God's will. This is God's design. Now what's interesting is this is the July the 12th response. By the end of July and early August, and I assume he got into this, he's a lot less certain about Charlie being in a better place. John himself is starting to feel tremendous psychological pain and torment, describing himself at one point as almost crazy, which is almost unheard of in support correspondence. And he experiences basically what can be described as a complete breakdown as a result of his brother's death. Now, I bring these two examples to the fore, though, to discuss the ways in which these soldiers are trying to represent death. How are they trying to portray this experience? How are they trying to understand this experience? How are they trying to render this experience onto paper to loved ones? And there are formulas that good death is a formula that they all go back to time and time again, but you can see the uncertainty. You can see the questions starting to thread themselves into this correspondence. You can feel how they themselves don't feel quite as certain. Now, by July the 3rd, after Pickett's charge, the situation began to deteriorate. And I think there's another important observation here. Someone like John Dooley, someone like Leonidas Torrance, someone like John Daniel, these are men who have repeatedly been in battle. Some historians like Gerald Liverman contend that over time, soldiers begin to manage the difficulty of war by becoming insensitive, indifferent to death. And Linderman in particular in, in Battle of Courage makes a very strong argument in that vein. Yet, at least through my brief examples here today, we have seen time and time again that these remain feeling men, deeply feeling men. And John Dooley, in fact, writes, I must confess that the terrors of the battlefield grew not less as we advanced in the war. And here's the important section. For in every battle, we see new forms of death, see many frightful and novel kinds of mutilation, see varying fortunes in the tide of strife, and appreciate so highly their deliverance from destruction. The dread was unending. Each battle, each battlefield, each day of the battle offered a new war for those who participated in the conflict. When Daniel concludes his account of the battle, he once again relies upon the language of emotion, the language of feeling, trying to make sense of what becomes, in his mind, a catastrophic defeat. By July the 4th, Confederate armies begin to retreat south, get stalled at Hagerstown, eventually cross the Potomac shortly thereafter. 
And as, as, as Daniel's trying to make sense of all this, he has this incredible section. I'll begin a little bit earlier. Never in the history of the army in Northern Virginia had the troops drunk so deeply of, worm, of the wormwood of disappointment. From the height of enjoyment and anticipation, they had suddenly plunged into the depths of pain and disappointment. The councils upon which they had feasted their eyes had suddenly proved illusions and had vanished like a dream. And what's so striking to me about this is John then is horrified to relate that he must do it again. And he begins to wonder to what purpose. I'm not saying there's a complete collapse in federal nationalism or federal morale, but soldiers begin to fundamentally question the cause for which they fight because of the effects of these battles, because of the sights they see on those battlefields. There again is this shaking of servitude, this uncertainty that begins to seep into the minds of many of these men as they're trying to make sense of these experiences. Now the AMV remains a cohesive fighting unit, no doubt. The Overland Campaign, over one year later, witnesses some of the worst fighting in the war, some of the fiercest fighting in the war. <clears throat> but the men themselves, I think, are starting to be transformed and changed in profound ways by these experiences. And I think we can best assess how they're responding to these scenes, again, through the lens of correspondence. So I think I need to probably start wrapping this up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back to Leonidas Torrance. And Torrance, as you recall, was the man who had seen the horrific scenes on the peninsula, had seen the horrific scenes um, at Chancellorsville, and then is going to be killed on July 1st, 1863. His messmate, his friend, is W.J. O'Daniel. O'Daniel and Torrance have a pledge. Leonidas, Leon, if you die in battle, I'll write your mother. I'll take your last effects. And then vice versa. So they have this agreement with each other. You're going into action on July the 1st in the area um, that's near the Eternal Peace Monument today, the Oak Hill area, and Leonidas is hit, mortally wounded, not killed instantly, but mortally wounded. But Daniel then is given the task of writing to his mother. And so it's an incredibly powerful letter. On the evening of the first of this month, the fighting began in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Our brigade was the first in it. Our company suffered dreadfully. Leonidas was alive when I left him, but I think he is not alive now. He was wounded in the head and thigh. His thigh was not broke, but I cannot tell what way the shot went. The ball on his head went in between the eye and the ear. I think it stopped someplace near his brain. This is key. This is why he's relaying this horrific detail. He came to his senses and told me that he was going to die and gave me all his things except his testament and his pocket handkerchief. He conveys those vital last words to the mother, right? The things the mother must know and understand. He told me to give these things to you. I was shot on the left cheek with a buckshot. I have not left our regiment. And then... He goes on in some detail, and then I, I cut, I, I piece of the letter, obviously. He has this one section there where basically he tells how. Ah, you do not have any idea how bad that I hated to leave Lawler. Oh, Daniel is just torn to pieces over there. He's, he's in tremendous distraught because he has to leave his friend on this battlefield, in this field hospital, knowing that his friend is ultimately going to die. Again, how are these men coping? With these experiences. Okay, so I'm going to try to bring this all, all together. So as we look across this historical landscape, historians have assessed Gettysburg in a number of different ways. Gary Gallagher has offered a very powerful um, contention that says, quote, a canvas of Confederate sentiment in the summer of 1863 suggests that many Southerners did not view the Battle of Gettysburg as a catastrophic defeat. He continues writing, Ari Lee's soldiers typically saw it as a temporary setback. 
with a few long-term consequences for the army. Okay, so Gallagher says basically this is not a catastrophic defeat. Lisa Laskin, in her dissertation, charges, it's not yet a book, but it's a brilliant dissertation, while a few perpetual optimists, or perhaps just misinformed people, referred to Gettysburg as a great victory, many a and soldiers recognized the severity of the blow their army received in Pennsylvania that summer. Despondency over the loss was compounded by the hard retreat back through Maryland and into Virginia, a retreat pictured in this image here. These two accounts don't reconcile. And so to get us out of this conundrum, I think what we can do is distinguish men's commitment to cause from their comprehension of battle. So scores of Confederates in the wake of the Battle of Gettysburg continue to affirm their allegiance to the Confederacy. They maintain faith in Lee's execution of the war, and by so doing, their morale, however shaken, remains unbroken. Yet once in Virginia, removed from the campaign's rigors, Men remained committed to the Confederacy, but had difficulty in conveying the experience of battle and processing the scale of carnage. Many soldiers, like the ones I've highlighted throughout this talk, could only respond with ambiguity that demonstrated both an awareness of the higher cause for which they fought, good death, right? He's in a better place, but also sorrow over the loss of life. And I think this ambiguity is best captured in the words of one North Carolina officer. Talking about the battle, he writes his wife, we also damaged the Yankees a great deal, but I cannot say who was hurt the worst. An incredibly ambiguous response to this catastrophic, culminating, transformative event. So let me, let me close on, on that, and do we do questions? Okay, and then um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to um, address them. And I can, again, I can talk more broadly if you're interested, um, but I can also answer questions about the talk. It's, it's up to you all, so any questions? Yes, yes sir. In your study and your research, did you find similar letters after the Battle of Antietam, if not, what would be the catalyst that would generate so many on Gettysburg? No, Gettysburg, uh, so I've, I've done a lot of that type of research to then make it into the book for other projects. Yes, there, there, I think by the spring of 1862, the, the general nature of the letters started to change. There's, you can find some Manassas and some, or some of the early actions of the war, but by 62, I think people started to realize the magnitude questions start to kind of seep in. And so, yeah, I think in the aftermath of the Maryland campaign, especially because it's so short-lived, especially because the Antietam itself is so horrific, there, there are some similar responses. And one response was very quickly. Um, it's by a North Carolinian, Calvin Leach, who's actually in the same brigade as the 3rd North Carolina. And Calvin Leach has this, this long description of South Mountain, and then he talks about the Antietam. And it's these two sections that are incredibly revealing. The first one is, I often took aim at the color card because he sees the flags, but I desperately hope I didn't hit anyone. So he's, he's doing his duty, he's shooting at a target that he can see, but he's desperately hoping that he actually didn't hit anyone. And later in the letter he says, throughout the day I often look up at the sun and pray it was set because I knew the day would be. Just desperate for the day to end, <clears throat> desperate for the carnage to stop. And, and, and so, for men who I think at this point are, are seasoned in battle, you certainly see an outpouring of these types of emotions. The one thing where I would tend to agree a bit with Linderman is by 64 and 65, I'm not saying they're unfeeling men, but they do become a bit more desensitized. They're a lot more willing to see dead men as objects and less as humans. And I think in 62 and 63 especially, they're still pretty horrified by those sites. But that said, some of the most vivid descriptions, of course, come out from the Battle of the Wilderness as people see their comrades literally being burned alive, and, and they're not unfeeling the visual effects. They're, they're profoundly moved by what they're seeing and desperate to try to stop it and they can't. 
We have a question online. Oh, okay. Um, she asked, what similarities or differences are there in the northern versus southern experience in this context? Good question. Um, so there, there's a whole host of answers that I can offer you. I mean, in terms of gender, to kind of start where I began to talk, northern men, I think, are a lot more willing to be intimate and emotionally transparent with other men. A lot of uh, middle-class northern men have been part of the reform movement. Uh, some have been evangelicals. A minor number have been abolitionists involved in temperance societies. They have been used to, I think, a lot more of kind of outpouring um, by the religious experiences, by the social experiences, and so I think they're a lot more just willing to form these affinities. So soldier, in some sense, comes a little more natural in that way. Um, I think the general responses to battle, north and south, are, are, are profoundly similar. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of skirt the question a bit and just say, you know, in Peter Carmichael's book, The War for the Common Soldier, it's a comparative study, and Peter and I talk about we talked through both of our projects together. We talked a lot about source materials that we find. And, 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 and Pete's done a lot more work on the North than I have. Pete has found a very similar response among Northern soldiers to the experience of battle and to the death of comrades. They themselves are just as shaken. They themselves have these kind of tremendous outpourings. What Pete does argue, though, which is an interesting contention that is different from the South, he contends and he's, he's using a little bit of Lewis Medan's argument from the Metaphysical Club, Northern soldiers assumed a degree of pragmatism, a degree of detachment from the experience of war. And I haven't found that in the South. He hasn't found that in the South. And so Medan argues in the broader work of pragmatism, the philosophical movement is born from the wartime experiences of people like all of the holes. Never again will you see an irrational event like this unfold. Never again will I be unable to control my destiny, my country, never again will this, this catastrophic event occur. And I think that is a very unique northern, middle class, upper class response to this experience. But again, I could find scores of letters for you all from Indiana soldiers, Wisconsin soldiers, you know, Pennsylvanians, that will offer very similar responses to the death of Conrad and to difficult in rendering this experience on the paper for a long time. Would you expect to see a parallel psychologically to those soldiers that survived these days? So, um, okay. uh, there are a couple of answers. Um, I love to point people in our directions. So I would say there's a really good documentary uh, called um, Aftershock, and it was by um, James Gandolfini, who was in the, so, this is, the Sopranos. And he became really interested in the subject. And he starts with the Civil War, talks about Soldier's Heart, talks about shell shock in World War I, talks about battle fatigue in World War II. He starts interviewing World War II veterans. And World War II veterans that he interviewed said, we were told that we fought the good people. We were told that we defeated um, Nazism, you know, that we liberated uh, the concentration camps, and that everything that we had done was justified. Now, they saw some very horrific scenes in those actions, and what the soldiers he interviewed, at least, said is that they suppressed those emotions, and a couple of the veterans that he interviewed, this is kind of a hard rock country to watch, had gone through certain marriages, had become alcoholics, and were suffering from what we call today PTSD. And they said that only in their 70s, in some cases, were they able to, to talk about it. Um, what I don't like to do is universalize the experience of war. And so what I always say about my study sample is Civil War soldiers lived in the pre-Freudian age. They did do psychoanalysis. So when they experienced these scenes, they more or less thought it was a physical ailment, soldier's heart. It was literally heart palpitations, anxiety. It wasn't a psychological disorder. And so when they would seek treatment, they would often go to an asylum for six months. The asylum would kind of okay, calm down, you know, no tobacco, no alcohol, less coffee. And then after six months, send them back into the world. But well, we know today, of course, that a veteran who is, is birthed by something like PTSD could have decades of rehabilitation that's required. And so in, in, in this world that they 
are living in, they're, they're, they're really ill-equipped to deal with this type of experience. Uh, again, to basically 2% of the population is killed. 750,000 Americans are killed, and, and then the experience of the are just incomprehensible. They're not equipped to deal with that. Our society, I would say, only in the past 10 to 15 years is fully engaged in a lot of those debates. I mean, the, even the Vietnam uh, veteran generation had a, a, a profound difficulty in the homecoming process, and then, again, uh, understanding the experience of war. So I think we have to be careful because each of these societies have responded differently. Each of these societies has progressed in some ways in medical treatment, psychological analysis, and so on. Um, but Gamble Feeney's documentary was incredibly revealing to me because I guess I should have thought, of course, they would have responded to something like this in the ways that they did. But it, again, it's just that, that overriding narrative that we as a country have, the various generation, these veterans just felt like they had that hold, that ideal. And by so doing, they couldn't show the type of weakness, weaknesses sorry, that they felt as, as men in that context. And of course, it is an auspicious day for that question. <laughs> Just a quick question on the first uh, gentleman you said, Dooley. Mm -hmm. He went to Georgetown and became a Jesuit priest. Mm -hmm. Obviously, had PTSD, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just kind of surprising. Yeah, Dooley, um, well, he had, he had been in college and then dropped out to serve in the First Virginia. Um, he was clearly a very thoughtful. But he's from Virginia, so there's not a whole lot of Catholics. Oh, oh, I see your point. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, no, that's extremely unusual. Yeah. Um, there's a pocket uh, in New Orleans. Um, urban areas in the South had small Catholic populations, but yeah, it, it's, it is unusual. And he himself is unusual. Yeah. That's just surprising. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. Yes, um, the Civil War divided families. Mm -hmm. We have way too much correspondence, or any correspondence, between brothers that fought on the opposite. Um, Amy Taylor uh, wrote a book called Things of Private Families. She concentrates entirely on that. The accounts that I have generally know. Um, so I have some families that had unionist sentiment within them, but they weren't actively fighting for the North. They were just opposed to their son going to the Confederacy. Um, the one extended account I did read was a family that was from Pennsylvania. The son moves to Louisiana in 1856, gets immersed in the community there, joins um, a, a Louisiana regiment, fights throughout the entire war. His family's opposed, but after the war, they're reconciled, and he gets married, and they're very, they, the family's very happy that he's getting married. And so I don't think any of his, his relatives in Pennsylvania fought, but they were definitely opposed to him joining the Confederacy. But that was one of the only examples that I had. That said, I was talking to the gentleman in the back earlier, Loudoun County, Waterford, I mean, you're in an area that had a lot of divided sentiment. And then, of course, I live in West Virginia, which was created as a result of a secession from a secessionist movement. And, and, and so it's out there. Um, but again, Amy Taylor's book is the definitive account that came out at this point, a decade ago. Um, but I myself only read that, that one account that was hinted at that sort of um, thing. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a very real occurrence. And again, in border counties like this, there's a lot of divided families that creates a lot of people on their own farms. I mean, the one thing that historians become a lot more attentive to, of course, is we're focused on I mean, this talk was on the battlefield, but I mean, think about what's going on on their own farms. You know, what's happening to these families in areas that is, where there's partisan war, where there's armies moving through, the decimation of fences, of crops, of all, you know, of all these different things. And so um, it's a profoundly destructive conflict on so many different levels. And so, you know, your question kind of gets to think about we have an example here in Waterford. Right, yeah. Oh, where one brother was fighting for the Union, oh, okay. one brother was fighting for the South. Okay. And in the Battle of Waterford, they had to stop the, uh, the Confederate brother from killing his Union brother. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. And that's, that's right out here in Waterford. Oh, yeah, in Waterford, yeah, I didn't realize this. Where, what's the family name? That's uh, okay. Is it? I think means, but that, I'm not really oh, sure. Okay. If you go to the Super Bowl round table, someone there will be able to tell you. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you read the, I can't remember the author's Defend the Valley, about the Winchester and the letters written back in that, in that family? Because that was really. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of the author, yeah. But it's been some years. Um, because there actually are a couple of famous unionists within Winchester, um, and that's the focus of the book. 
the, the correspondence, is it not? Correspondence is between the families. Like, I never knew that if you were shot over there and you had family down there, then you would go stay with your aunt so-and-so right. to recuperate. I just thought we stayed in the hospital. I didn't know that you would leave and go to somebody's cousin's house that your family knew each other. Especially among, in, among Virginians. Yeah, um, yeah, this was all up and down the valley. Yeah. Up and down the valley. Yeah. Um, and the, the reminder, a couple, there's a couple unionist accounts from um, Ferryville, which is just obviously outside of the Winchester, but um, yeah, it's been a couple of years, but I did read that, yeah, I should be looking at that. It was actually her family. I think it was her family that, that she finally put the letter together. Okay, yeah. Is there any uh, effort of censorship of letters? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> um, so one of the, the um, one of the ways in which um, both, so at the press level, there's no censorship. It's, it's shocking the type of information that is um, released in newspapers. And in the letters themselves, there's, there's, there's virtually no evidence for that. The only type of censorship you might see is the type of public letters. So a letter that's written to a mother and usually is kind of threaded with patriotism, nationalism, might make it into a newspaper. So in that way, the press is kind of manipulating public sentiments through the eyes of a soldier. But would you know? Would you read the um, you know? Would you read a Fudge letter that had um, you know giant black marks on? No, there was just it never occurred. Um, there's a, a complete freedom, more or less, freedom of the press in, in that regard. Now we can talk about the Lincoln administration and, and some of the suppression. Um, and then again, we can talk about the manipulation by the press, but soldiers' correspondence was entirely unvarnished. And that's why uh, the gentleman in the back and I were talking earlier, and you know, it's like, why are people so, you know, why are so many people interested in this period? Well, at least for, you know, we as historians, we just don't have this type of material. I mean, unless you move into the 20th century when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of documents or 19th century scholars, this is just an incredible entry into all sorts of different socioeconomic classes, races, gender, you know, whatever, and it's all more or less unfiltered. And so no, it, it's, it's, it's entirely their perspectives, and it's just a remarkable disclosure that, again, is like unparalleled for at least the time period I studied. So. Is some of your prisoner of war envelopes on fit? Is so that's some censorship yeah, in so your prisoner of war? That's, yeah, yeah, and so soldiers in the field, yeah, POWs, that gets into a lot more complicated story. Yeah, that's absolutely.